Now, rational functions, what do we mean by rational functions? Um, rational is um, uh, the adjective for the word ratio, right? So what we're comparing is uh, where you've got in particular um, a, a polynomial on the top and a polynomial on the bottom and you divide, okay? So there's a ratio between the two functions. So the whole thing is a rational function. Now where we'll begin with is our most basic of the rational functions, the familiar hyperbola. If you can't remember, that's what these things are called as opposed to parabolas. Um, this is something you first encountered probably in year 10, maybe even year nine if you were super advanced. Um, the hyperbola, I hope, is a familiar um, thing to graph. And so let's have a go at putting uh, the information onto our uh, Cartesian plane here. Um, there's some important features which um, you might recall from last time. It's similar with exponentials and logs. We're looking for shape, uh, intercepts, and asymptotes, this time plural because the hyperbolas tend to have more than one. Um, and also, if necessary, we want to point for scale, but um, there's no popular singers that I know called CAP. So anyway, I'll put those in brackets, okay? Now, where are um, the, wh what is the overall shape of this thing? Well, you've got these um, curvy two separate branches that look roughly like this. One in the uh, first quadrant in the top right, and then one in the third quadrant in the bottom left. And then when you think about this particular graph, it actually has no intercepts. That's kind of weird and unusual. Most of the other ones, when you introduce a transformation of some kind, like a, a translation somewhere, you're going to collide with one of the coordinate axes. So usually we'll get some intercepts, but not this guy. Um, and then also we have asymptotes. So there's gonna be a vertical asymptote right here along the y-axis and its equation is x equals zero. And then also we'll have a horizontal asymptote over here along the x-axis. And accordingly, its equation is y equals zero. Now in this case, because I have no intercepts, not even one, I definitely, definitely need a point for scale somewhere because this graph here, I mean, I'm suggesting that it's y equals one over x, but it could just as easily be y equals two over x or one over two x or any other sort of similar looking hyperbola. So I need to provide a point, some set of coordinates, choose an easy value of x that will work conveniently for you, like say x equals one. When you put in x equals one, you get y equals one over one. So one is gonna be the y coordinate as well. So I've got a point for scale. This can't be any other hyperbola. It has to be one over x. Now, what I wanna do is um, dive, before we get into the worked examples, dive a little more deeply into understanding the features of this. We've talked about asymptotes before with exponentials and logs, but with hyperbolas, with rational functions, you have to be a little more cautious, so it's worth actually thinking in more detail about them. Now to understand them better, uh, I'm gonna use an old tool that we've used many times in the past, which is a table of values. And I'd love you for you to copy down something like this um, next to or beneath your um, graph of one over x. And I'm having a look at some particular values of x and the values of y you get when you substitute them in. So we're actually gonna, I know it sounds weird, but I'm actually gonna start all the way over here um, because I've already got that value. When I substitute in x equals one, I'm gonna get y also equals one. And as I go to the right, as my x values increase. What's happening? Like what does the graph tell you and what do your numbers tell you? Well, as you substitute the x values in, you get uh, one over 10 which I guess you could write as uh, 0.1. Then you get one over 100, which I guess we could write as 0 0.01. And then at the end of my table anyway, I get one over 1,000. So that's, how many zeros is that? 0 0.001, okay? So what you see here in the numbers is what you would predict based on looking at the graph up here, right? As you go to the right, as X values increase, you get closer and closer to the x-axis, to the horizontal asymptote, okay? And that's, that's why the horizontal asymptote is there. It's a line that we're approaching and approaching and approaching forever, okay? Now we can see the same thing on the left-hand side if I now look at uh, this spot over here. Um, I'm just looking at the same values but negative, so I'm going to see the same kind of pattern. When I do one over, substitute the x value in, um, you're gonna get one over negative one, which is negative one. 1 over negative 10, I'm going to skip straight to the decimal here, it's going to be negative 0 0.1, then negative 0 0.01, and negative 0 0.001. Now this is the important thing to grab out of this, right? On the right hand side, we notice we're approaching 
uh, the x-axis, y equals zero. Because look, the, these numbers over here, they're teeny tiny, right? And they, they get tinier as you go along. Now over here on the left-hand side, we're also getting teeny tiny. These are also very small values. We're still approaching the x-axis. We're still approaching y equals zero. But importantly, and you can see the graph tells you why, we're not approaching it from the same direction. We're actually approaching it from the bottom. You've got negative values all the way through this table here. We're approaching it from the bottom rather than from the top. Okay. Now, of course, we know, and you can see I've delicately avoided there, there's a value right there in the middle, which I have um, deliberately not evaluated, which is zero, because we can't divide by zero, right? You're kind of, um, things blow up, so we've just left that value off there. But what I want to get across to you here is, this horizontal asymptote at y equals zero, where does it come from? It comes from putting in these very large values of x, um, or very large negative values of x, okay? So file that in your mind for a second. Now what we're going to do is focus in on this part in the middle where we don't know what's going on. Okay, If I actually just look between negative 1 and 1, if we now draw another table of values that just focuses on this part of the graph uh, and chooses some x values that are appropriate, well, what's going on? Uh, we know you're not allowed to put in 0 because um, you're not allowed to divide by 0, things blow up. Um, but what happens when you put in values that are sort of nearby, in the neighborhood as it were? What I'm going to do is I'm going to start at the same place that I started before, which was uh, at x equals 1. I already know what that value is. It's 1. Now what happens when you put in values that get closer and closer to x equals 0? We can't get there exactly, but I can get pretty close, right? Well, when you put in an x value like 1 over 10, you're now getting y equals 1 over 1 over 10. So the reciprocal of 1 over 10, which is, of course, 10. Um, when you move along, when you get even closer, you get the reciprocal of 1 over 100, so it's 100. Uh, and then, when, like this is as far as my table is going to go, when I get to x equals 1 over 1,000, so this is really, really close to the y-axis, it's really close to x equals 0, you of course get a value of y equals 1,000. And again, looking back up at the graph, this is exactly what we expect. What I'm looking at on my table of values is what's happening um, as I go to the left. And as I go left, I go up. I get higher and higher and higher, okay? Now, maybe by now you're kind of predicting where I'm going here, right? If I do it the other side, um, what I'm getting is um, the reciprocal of negative 1, which is also negative 1, the reciprocal of negative 1 over 10, which is negative 10, negative 100, and then negative 1,000. So unlike in the table of values above, where you know as you went to these big values of x, you ended up getting to the same spot, it's just from above or from below, okay? Here, we're going to two completely different places. When x gets small on the positive side, you get really, really big values for y. When x gets small on the negative side, you get really, really negative values for y. And again, one more time, coming back to the graph, that's exactly what you should expect as you can see us going down, dropping close to x equals zero, the vertical asymptote. Now the reason why I sort of um, dwelled on this table of values is because it shows you that horizontal and vertical asymptotes, despite both being called asymptotes and kind of like geometrically they look very similar, they actually have function and behave very differently. One of them comes from when you look at really, really big values off to the sides of your graph. We call them extreme values. Um, things like, you know, x equals a thousand, x equals negative a thousand. But what about this vertical asymptote and the behavior here? Well, it comes from what happens when you get closer and closer to a spot you're not allowed to go to, right? Let me say that one more time. Vertical asymptotes, they come from what the graph does, what the function does, as you get closer to some disallowed value, some value where the function breaks down, okay? Now we have language for all of this. We have formal notation that kind of unpacks this. Um, and it comes back to, sorry, I'm getting my screen the right size. It comes back to stuff we introduced right at the beginning of differentiation. Um, let's do the horizontal asymptote for starters. We would say um, the limit as x approaches infinity, as x gets huge, um, the limit of, of this particular um, function, well, what did we say it approached as x got really, really big? We would say it's, it's getting closer and closer to zero, right? We also notice that if you put in really, really enormous negative values on this function, whoops, I want that to be bigger, in the same function, um, you also approach 
zero. But then we also pointed out that you don't approach zero in the same way. Um, when you're approaching from this side, you're approaching from the top and you get closer and closer, you sort of drop down, okay? But when you're approaching on this side, you're sort of increasing, you're going up. So the way that we denote that, and this is um, slightly weird notation, which some of you have seen because Mrs. Lee has explained this um, in the past when people have asked about it. The way we would explain this is, or write it I should say is, we approach zero from the top, which means uh, you know, we write a plus here to say you're coming from the top going down. And then for this one down the bottom, we say we approach it from the underneath. We approach it from the negative direction. Now this is weird notation, right? It's not, it's not like we're saying zero is positive or negative. We're saying we're approaching that same value from above or from below, okay? Now when it came to vertical asymptotes, we were doing another limit, but it wasn't as x got really big. It was as x approached this um, disallowed value, this value where we have a discontinuity is the technical name. Now we approach it um, and that discontinuity is at zero, but remember we approached it from two different sides and you've got two completely different behaviors, right? So I'm gonna use this notation that I've just introduced, um, zero from the positive side or zero from the negative side. I'm gonna use these, this new notation to distinguish between the two approaches, okay? So when I approach zero from the positive side and I look at this function, what do I get? Well, this thing, it approaches infinity, really large values. Denominator gets small, the whole thing gets large, goes toward infinity. And by contrast, when x approaches that same zero but from the other side, when it's approaching from the negative side, which in this case is from the left, on this function, you don't approach infinity, you approach negative infinity, okay? Now, I promise, I'm almost at the end of the, the, the sort of theory here, right? This, is, this has really important implications for how you graph things because what we're saying is vertical asymptotes, they come from these domain discontinuities, uh, places where the graph is not allowed to go. Um, you put in x equals zero to this graph or other values of x, as you'll see in a second for different graphs, things just blow up, right? So instead of going exactly there, we just try and see what happens nearby. You get asymptotic behavior. Horizontal asymptotes, on the other hand, they come from a completely different idea. They come from extreme values. Um, as you get really, really large things on the left-hand side or on the right-hand side of the graph. And like I said, this has implications for how you draw things. For example, because vertical asymptotes um, come from these discontinuities, not allowed to go there, right? You can never pass, you can never cross a vertical asymptote. It's not allowed. As soon as you draw a vertical asymptote on your graph, you know that your actual function will never cross it, okay? Horizontal asymptotes though, they're a completely different kettle of fish. You can cross horizontal asymptotes sometimes multiple times, sometimes an infinite number of times if you have the right function. So even though we call them both asymptotes, they do actually behave quite differently. And I'm gonna give you some worked examples now that highlight that 